Hello, everyone. My name is Paul Buiting. I'm very pleased to have Professor Richard Werner on again. Uh, we talked two years ago when we talked about uh, how the ECB uh, is uh, trying to become the only bank in town. And I really want to understand more about how that would work and to what extent uh, the ECB is achieving that goal. Uh, Richard, he's the author of Princes of the Yen, a best-selling book. He also um, came up with the quantity theory of credit. He coined the term, the term QE and he just uh, he's working on a lot of things. Uh, also a new decentralized uh, community bank network. So we're going to talk about all of that. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Richard, for being on again. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you for having me again. It's a pleasure. Yeah, first of all, uh, let me apologize uh, to you and the viewers because last uh, conversation two years ago, I interrupted you a lot. I got a lot of uh, negative feedback <laughs> about this. So sorry about that. No worries. No worries. Uh, this time, I'm fine. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it was also like a delay in, con in, the, in the connection or something. But um, so, yeah, last time we talked about um, the ECB and, and especially also about the concept of revealed intent. And you said you have to judge a person or an institution by its actions and not so much by its words. And if we look at the actions of the ECB, we've seen over the past few years, thousands of banks that have been wiped off the map, especially in countries like Holland. Um, and so I wanna know, we talked last time two years ago, have things changed? Are they still on their way to become the only bank? Is that still their uh, intent, their, their goal? I think there's no change in the fundamental goal. And essentially, the, the ECB has adopted a, um, a long-term policy of attrition where they've been forcing banks in the Eurozone um, onto their knees by fundamentally two things. One is regulation. The regulatory burdens have increased significantly of European banks are small banks, very small banks. Um, and the ECB has made essentially uh, through most of that time period, no exception for small banks. So they've had to meet the same reporting requirements as the, the super largest banks. And for, for those uh, for, for who essentially these regulations were made and particularly after the 2008 crisis, um, the argument was, well, these big banks, they messed up, so we need tight regulations, tough regulations for all banks. Well, <laughs> the majority of banks are small banks, and it was particularly the community banks, local banks, small banks, cooperative banks, savings banks, that were absolutely fine, particularly in, in countries like Germany, um, Switzerland, you know, they, they had absolutely no problem. They were not involved in the the mess that that caused the 2008 crisis and of course this second point is monetary policy and that in itself was even responsible for the 2008 crisis but anyway so but they they forced all these small banks to meet these super high uh, standards of reporting which are extremely costly and that's the biggest problem for the small banks you know if you've got 20 staff you're a small bank small balance sheet it's all very much under control but suddenly you need to hire one or maybe two more people just to do this new regulatory reporting that's required. It just adds huge costs to them. And, uh, you know, staffing costs are the biggest costs. Um, and, and so for, for many of those banks, and so they had, they were forced to merge. And we, we hear this again and again, and this pressure has continued. So since the ECB started business, 5,000 banks disappeared, and it's not the big ones. In the US, there's a different regulatory regime namely the small banks get different rules and the argument is well you guys are small you're not systemically relevant you don't pose a systemic threat to the system because you're very small and local so hey let's have simpler regulation as we've had in the past you know regulations become more burdensome more complex over time more and more and more and more and more um and the very big banks are able to manage this, but for small banks, you know, that's, it's just impossible and also totally unnecessary. And the US is best evidence of that, that um, you can have a separate regulatory regime. In fact, an entirely different regulator, don't even report to the same regulator. Um, and that is, is, is very much necessary in Europe, but the ECB so far has refused that 
in recent years, they've said, okay, we'll do tiny, tiny adjustments for small banks and small loans. And they, they slightly changed the capital adequacy risk weights for um, business loans to small firms and things like that. But these are minor um, changes and tinkering. Overall, that's been one of the big policies to just make life very expensive, very difficult due to regulation and reporting and bureaucracy, incredible bureaucracy um, for banks. The second pillar is monetary policy. They adopted a policy of squeezing banks' profits. Banks make profits by um, essentially taking deposits and you get um, lower interest rates or for current deposits, you know, current accounts, zero interest on those. And then they lend out uh, money. At least that's what it looks like. If you look at, at one bank at, at one moment in time, we'll talk about the um, what's going on behind the scene there. But um, in terms of the profits, it is actually this margin between the interest rate of taking deposits and lending out money at high interest rates. And essentially, they, they squeeze both. Um, and particularly on the uh, lending side, long-term interest rates have been pushed down. Um, even, even just yesterday, today, we, we well, uh, today we hear that um, ECB is, um, wants to continue to intervene in the bond markets to push down long-term interest rates or keep them down. Now, it's quite extraordinary because we've had two years of massive monetary expansion. We'll talk more about that and that what has happened in the last two years. And, and as I warned um, already two years ago, you know, we, we were going to get inflation because the way they did it is very different from 2008. They massively expanded credit for consumption, for purchases, um, while not increasing the amount of goods and services available, but just increasing demand and money buying things because you are pushing up prices and that's the inflation we're getting now it's a monetary phenomenon don't believe them when they talk about oh it's the war it's russia well this was actually caused uh, from february march 2020 onwards with this a concerted monetary policy of massively injecting creating injecting new money used for consumption so of course inflation goes up that means interest rates you know inflation is nominal phenomena interest rates are nominal will be pushed up, but the ECB now wants to step in and prevent that. And already two years ago, they said crazy stuff like, oh, we see that uh, bond, you know, bond uh, prices are going down, yields are going up, interest rates are going up. We need to step in and do something. What are we gonna do? Let's buy more bonds. Now, but when the central bank buys bonds, that means it's printing money. Why are we having this bond you know, yields going up, interest rates going up because of inflation. Why is there inflation? Because of money printing. And what's been their solution? Oh, let's let's buy more of these bonds. Then we can push, you know, um, down, um, you know, support the bond markets, you know. Um, but actually they're creating more money, which is really just going to um, cause more inflation, which means um, actually ultimately, <laughs> the bond market will reflect that and um, bond prices will fall even though the ECB is trying to push up bond prices by just being the main buyer of bonds. Um, but the side effect of this crazy policy of the ECB manipulating the bond markets massively uh, by you know buying bonds pushing up bond prices uh, therefore keeping down the yields that worried about italy in particular which has a lot of debt and uh, refinancing costs uh, an issue there so um the corollary of that policy um on the one hand has been to fuel inflation particularly asset price inflation already before um the recent 2020 policies you know since 2008 they've been really fueling asset prices by um, forcing banks to mainly move into asset uh, lending. But it's also undermined traditional banks that lend to businesses because you are squeezing their, their margins because then the loan um, interest rate has also been pushed down together with bond market interest rates. And it's essentially that the ECB has made it not very profitable to be a traditional bank 
that helps small firms and lends for productive purposes, which is the sound thing to do. Because the, when, when the banks mainly lend for productive purposes, um, lending to small firms for business investment, that's very sound. You, essentially, you won't get a banking crisis. You won't get a problem. And you also won't get inflation if you mainly have money creation, banks lending for these productive business investment purposes. You get economic growth, job creation. But the ECB policy mix has essentially made that unattractive and forced the banks to lend for asset purchases, creating this asset inflation, which, of course, is unsustainable, will lead to a banking crisis, is unavoidable. And, uh, of course, there are ways to stop that if they want to, but uh, you know, well, we can talk about that. But it looks like you know, a blowout is, um, is, is, is more likely what they want to. But they're certainly in this phase where they've been creating this asset bubble, um, and inflation as since 2020, which was the new measure, um, they were also creating money for uh, consumer spending. Therefore, we now have general consumer price inflation. But meanwhile, the banks in their traditional business and the small banks are mainly traditional lenders were squeezed out. And so they're more and more were forced to, to merge. So it's, it's quite a disastrous policy mix. But I've seen it time and again, you know, when I was uh, looking at Japan, as, as the book Princes of the Yen details, the, it's quite astonishing how over a long time period, um, decades, 20 years, 30 years, the, the string of policy mistakes, of bad policy, <laughs> is so consistent that if you want to write a script how to completely blow up an economy, and then that is the one of many, many policy options, the one string of policies you take. Uh, and that seems to be what, what they're taking time and again. And the, um, the Bank of Japan was a pioneer in this, and the ECB has been a great admirer of Bank of Japan policies. Uh, and by the way, the book uh, is somewhat hard to find. Um, people always ask how to get it. There's some very expensive uh, copies on Amazon, but the, the best is directly from the publisher at um quantumpublishers.com quantumpublishers.com anyway i'll put a link in the in the show notes <laughs> oh yes please yeah so with some summarize you that there are two main reasons uh, for the destruction of the small banks it's on the one hand uh, overly burdensome regulatory policies and on the other end there's monetary monetary policy squeezing the margins and you have to be a bank, big bank in order to survive um do you think this uh, this this strategy is uh, something um, that is 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 purposefully. Um, it is not on purpose, right? It is, it is not some sort of. They are making the same mistakes as in Japan. They haven't done their homework. I, they have done their homework, and this is actually what they want, right? Yes. Well, you know, we have counter examples, and we have plenty of historical um, precedents that we can look at. So concerning how you should treat banks and small banks, it's clear we have the US example. You know, you should treat the small banks differently and give them much lighter regulation and less burdensome reporting requirements. And that works. I mean, there's no nobody suggesting, oh, that you know, America's done it for for several decades and it doesn't work. No, there's no such evidence. So um, so that's one. And then concerning the other policies, yeah, we've got the counter example of Japan that um, has um, previously taken this combination of surprisingly disastrous policies, first creating an asset bubble and then a, a big banking blow up. And so, of course, these are policies we should want to avoid. Um, and uh, it's disappointing that the ECB doesn't seem to, um, to want to, to do that. The ECB did pick up some of my recommendations um, quite a few years ago, it was almost 10 years ago, when I also gave some presentations at the ECB and I pointed out the importance of disaggregating bank credit and looking at where the money is going, as we've been discussing now. Um, and it should mainly go into the real economy, not for asset purchases. And so since around 2012, they have in their monthly reports that the ECB started to write about, oh, we need to increase bank credit for the real economy. <laughs> and of course, there's no economic theory except mine, which says that. Um, so they have adopted my, my advice to the extent that there's some economists out there that write these reports that are pointing this out. 
sadly, it seems the, the decision makers behind the policies that um, that the ECB is taking, they haven't um, taken this on board yet. Or it may be that they just don't want this. And, and you know, the longer this continues, the more the likely it is that they actually just simply pursuing different policy goals. Perhaps coming back to the other point um, you raised, the you know the central bank digital currencies, there is actually a bit of good news out just a few days ago. Namely, um, there's there's a new message that's been sent out. Um, of course, it's not officially from central banks because that would be um, far too embarrassing. Um, they've launched it through the PR organ of the central banks, which is the Financial Times, um, which is now even owned by the Nikkei. And the Nikkei in Japan, the Nihon Keizai Shimbun, short Nikkei, um, where the Nikkei index comes from, like the FTSE index, the Financial Times in the stock index. Um, um, this Nikkei was always very, very um, dominated by the Bank of Japan, has always been pro-central bank, and it's very, very obvious. And so this Financial Times was always very, very similar, um, rarely criticizing the central banks and giving them a nice platform for whatever they want to say. And they've now come out, and they've, they've used one of their spokespeople there in the Financial Times to proclaim that, oh, central bank digital currency maybe we should be careful, maybe we should not rush it, and maybe we should um, introduce only wholesale CBDC, not retail CBDC. And this is something we should talk about because that's an important distinction. I've been talking about this before, um, but it's, it seems now ripe for, um, for more uh, sort of general consumption that you need to make this um, distinction. And it's very good news because um, I've been arguing if you if you introduce CBDC, and I'm, I'm really against CBDC, but there's clearly a lot of momentum and pressure for doing it, then there are two types. And one is what they've been discussing at the ECB and other central banks in, in Europe in particular, which is retail CBDC, whereby uh, essentially... I mean, it's, it's a misnomer. It's really a current account at the central bank. It's only if you realize that, then you realize, you know, why, why call it CBDC? Because if it's a current account at the central bank, well, it's similar to an account at the bank. And we should use our current money. We should call it um, CBD. Sorry, not, not CBDC, but um, bank digital currency, BDC. Sorry, that's the one, BDC. We should call it BDC. Right. But if you did that, you realize that actually CBDC and BDC, bank, um, digital currency, are very, very similar. And the difference is the C, the centralization aspect of it, which is really the point. So with this retail central bank digital currency, everyone gets a current account at the central bank. And that, of course, is quite clear, is more or less the end of banking. Initially, you can say, no, it's not, and the banks will be able to compete and so on. But hang on, this is the bank regulator saying, I'm going to step into the arena and I'm going to compete with my regulator. Do they have a chance? It's like in football, if the, the umpire says, well, I'm a bit bored running around here and just watching, I'm going to join now and I'm going to actually score some goals now. Now, let's see. And oh, you get out of my way, you know, whistle. Red card for you, yellow card for you, get out of the way. I'm going to score a right. goal. How easy is it going to be for the umpire to do that? Does anyone else have a chance? No, they're meant to be umpires. They're not meant to join the game. But this is what retail CBDCs are. It's the umpire getting into the game, suddenly competing and actually using all the powers available. So you just need a bit of a shock, a crisis. All the money would move from the bank deposits to the central bank and the banking system shuts down, you get monobanking, you get one central bank Sovietization. Now, that seems to be what some of these central, plan central planners really want, but it seems they've realized, okay, we're not quite getting it. And maybe the interview we did and, and the, um, you know, the, the work that's recently been done 
in making people aware of the dangers of central bank digital currency has has caused them to pause a little bit because now they've said okay hang on maybe we shouldn't go for retail cbdc and it looks to me like they've decided okay we'll do this step by step and first we'll have wholesale cbdc what exactly is wholesale cbdc could you explain it with and also with an example how would it work and how would we notice yes now this is what i've been recommending for this situation where it seems like we're gonna get cbdc then we should do it the wholesale way which is the chinese way this is how the chinese central bank has done it now you have to understand the chinese situation china until recently had a soviet style system with very few banks you know almost a soviet mono banking system in the soviet union there was an era where there was just literally one bank gos bank and they had many branches and that's it no other bank and china had more or less that system before deng xiaoping came to power now deng xiaoping when he came to power um, he he studied japan and he looked at <clears throat> germany and the us and he concluded okay well we want a successful system and the japanese system of course was was the most attractive to him because japan has been essentially a one party state as far as the political structure is concerned and that's of course you know what we have in china and that seems to work but economically the system delivered and he thought well that's the best way to get everyone on board and stay in power we deliver the goods so how are we going to do that well let's look more how japan is doing it and realized well they have a lot of banks they have many banks small banks local banks and so when he came back from his japan trip that's what he did he changed the banking system and also how the central bank operates and interacts with the banks and he created thousands of banks community banks savings banks uh, regional banks provincial banks cooperative banks um credit unions of course also some big champions national champions um and so on and so now china has the second largest number of banks on on planet earth just behind the us almost 5000 banks and that's very recent i mean this only started from the 1980s onwards and it delivered four decades of double digit economic growth you know you just need yeah. four or five years of uh, double digit economic growth and you've doubled your national income so they've multiplied national income many many times over in this time period raised more people out of poverty than any time in any place in history before phenomenal success and in china people realize it's the banking system that's a key factor in this so now the latest trend among central planners and you know the chinese of course are also looking at all the various central planning things uh, Deng Xiaoping was very much a decentralizer within uh, within the Chinese system but they see that oh wow the west is really increasing centralization um in fact perhaps briefly we should mention the european union as a construct um seems to have been modeled on the soviet union i mean there's some uh, some russian experts who've um pointed this out and it's it seems quite obvious uh, that it's actually true you know the soviet union had a parliament it had a parliament but you've got a smile you yeah. know that parliament and you ask why is not very powerful right it wasn't very powerful it was a rubber stamp parliament, but it existed and what what weakened its powers well it couldn't table any laws yeah. so it's Just a like joke, a right? so mm, that what does that remind us of oh that's actually the european parliament it's it's a rubber stamp parliament they can't table any they can't propose any laws where do the laws come from well what about the soviet union they came from the politburo now the politburo was this central organ that had commissars there and that they they were not elected of course and they um they decided and formulated the new laws which were then given to the parliament to rubber stamp what does that sound like to you where do we have commissars commissioners <laughs> yeah well <laughs> of I, course, my fellow dutchman uh, timmermans uh, is is definitely uh, operating that way <laughs> exactly well so it is the, the european commission the european commission is the politburo 
of this Soviet system that we have called the EU. Um, and the parliament is just, the European parliament is just like a Soviet parliament. So, um, so the Chinese saw that, all right, okay, so they, are, they like the Soviet system, maybe we should have a look at this, Sovietization. And oh, so now they're talking about the central bank digital currency. Well, that surely means, you know, if you do it this retail way, you are going to reduce the number of banks to ultimately one, and you're going to get mono banking, uh, which some central planners love and they get really excited about. But the Chinese said, well, hang on, hang on. We've, we've done that. We've been there just recently. And we've just now <laughs> introduced so many banks we created all these banks that's given us so much prosperity should we really give this up we're not going to do that i mean if these guys in europe are silly enough to do that let them do it but we're not going to do that and so um but we want to be at the forefront of what's happening with digital revolution and stuff like that and of course you know digital tools are smart and smart means you're getting controlled, you're getting watched, you get your data and your activities are getting very powerful and very, very successful. There's actually no doubt that this Chinese success was largely the fact that there's thousands of local banks kicking the tires, checking out things before they make the loan. It's a decentralized system. It's always much more resilient and better than a central planner trying to centrally do this for the whole country. It's, you know, China is far too big. It doesn't make sense. So, um, they introduced what can be called wholesale CBDC. Namely, they said, okay, the, the, the CBDC is really the idea fundamentally is, and that's how it's marketed also in, in Europe, is a modern version of cash, a digital version of cash. In Europe, that's so far been more or less PR because they were not actually discussing doing that. Because if you did that, because how's, how does cash come into circulation? I mean, do you go to the central bank to get your cash, Paul? Not anymore. It, well, used, to be, it, it used to be the case uh, and, uh, until the uh, late 70s, early 80s, I think. You went to the central bank or your, your, the central your, bank your parents like through, went to the central bank? They had to get the franchises uh, in, in, in across uh, Holland uh, where you could also get your cash. But yeah, of course, you go to a commercial bank. If you can yes. find one that still offers it, that because it's something that's um, quite rapidly disappearing from the street anyway. Yes. Well, in England, you can you can still go to the central bank um, because the the Bank of England notes say that it's a promise uh, to pay to the bearer, and you can go to the Bank of England and get your um, you know hand in your twenty pound note and say it's a promise to pay, so please pay me. And there's a law which says they will pay you. How? If it's 20 a 20 pound note, they'll give you two 10 pound notes. Right. So if you come with five pound notes, that's the end of the line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They can give you coins. <laughs> no, they don't. They don't actually, because they don't um, produce those. They order from the treasury, <laughs> from the mint. So um, that's the end of the line. So um, yes, where do we get cash from? It's come from the banks because the banks are the intermediaries that deal with the retail sector. And the central bank is a wholesale operator, mostly, that um, deals with the banks. So this two-tier system is the system that we've had. And that's historically been the case in, in many countries. And that has allowed this decentralization that we have many banks that take the local decisions and has put the banks um, in front of the public. And they're really the, the face of the monetary system and the, the financial system. And the Chinese have introduced already, I mean, so far it's officially a pilot scheme, but they've introduced it, this slowly um, expanding it and increasing the geographical coverage um, of their central bank digital currency, but it's a wholesale system. So you will get your central bank digital currency through your bank. How did that happen? Well, it happened because they already had digital payment systems the WePay and Alipay has been used for many years now in China as the main mode of, of paying paper money has become quite quite rare particularly in the big cities people just don't pay with paper money anymore everywhere you go tiny amounts um, people use their phones and they um, you put either the Alipay or WePay app on there but how does that work well 
the Alipay and WePay, you know, they're not financial institutions. They are digital services providers. And in order to get your Alipay account and then get your QR code and make the payment, and you have to have an account with a bank. It's always linked to a bank. So behind, you know, people talk about, oh, Alipay, WePay dominating the financial system. It's not true. They're just the, the face, the front, the shop window of the digital payments de facto so far. Um, behind that has been the, the Chinese banks. And it can be any bank, your bank. You know, you, if it's a local small provincial bank, then that's the bank. You, you need to have a bank account and then that's plugged into the system. And so likewise with central bank digital currency, now the, the central bank decided, okay, Alipay and, and WePay, they're getting too, too big for their boots and they're actually commercial operators. That um, was demonstrated a couple of years ago when um, the, the head of Alibaba suddenly disappeared. And he was going to have a, a big IPO, I think the biggest in, in world history. Um, and was it even meant to be in America, uh, New York IPO or something, or maybe Hong Kong? But anyway, the, he had not uh, done the formal steps of getting approval from the necessary authorities in China. He felt, I'm so big, this is the biggest IPO, nobody's going to stop me. Well, they stopped him. <laughs> okay, they said, well, hang on, you are not in charge of um, of monetary policy and financial system regulation. So um, reconsider. And, you know, he did reconsider. Um, and that was the beginning of essentially the, the regulators in China um, going after Alibaba Group, which is Alipay. And in general, these two payment providers, because they were dominating all payments, which is a very powerful position. It wasn't that powerful because there were still the banks behind it, but still it was quite powerful. And that's why the central bank came and said, well, actually they're performing a function that there should at least be public offering there as well. So we're gonna introduce central bank digital currency to compete with Alibaba, you know, Alipay and WePay. And so that's how they structured. They use the same system where you need a bank account to plug in in order to get the central bank and digital currency. So that's why it's a two-tier system. And that's why you need a bank. And that's why in this Chinese system, you're not killing the banks. And that's a smart system because that, that way you maintain the decentralization. And how would it work in practice then? So with, with Alipay, for example, I, I, I then top up my Alipay account by connecting it with my uh, bank, my normal bank account. Exactly. And, and if I would then uh, want to use the Chinese CBDC, uh, then I need to connect you need my to have a bank account. Uh, yeah, but I connect my bank, bank account to the PBOC uh, um, uh, system and then it tops up my bank account and then I can top up uh, my Precisely. Alipay account, for example. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Now, of course, you realize when you think this through that, okay, it's a small step and it, it will be easy in the future for a central bank to say, okay, now we do this directly and it will be easy to switch to retail. And that's, of course, the dangerous thing and the dangerous temptation. With China, I'm not actually worried about it because as we, as we said, they know the value of banks. They know the value of a decentralized banking system. That's how China became so successful and so powerful. They're not gonna kill the goose that's been laying these fantastic golden eggs. But in the West, I'm very concerned. I'm not even sure they realize how important and, and um, effective it is to have a banking system with many small banks. They're very much into oh, small banks, small fry. You know, that's a, um, it's an issue. We want a small number of big banks. I mean, that's not a good system, uh, but it seems that that's, that's what the central planners in the West admire. And so I'm very concerned. And now, so now back to this, this news item. So there was this, this story out in the Financial Times just a couple of days ago saying that, oh, the, and I think they were talking about conversations at Davos and whatever. Um, the talk now seems to be, mm, let's go the wholesale route. They did not, interestingly, in this article, China is not mentioned. That essentially, this is what China has yeah. been doing all along. They've been smart. They thought about this. That's what they went for. That's not mentioned as if it's sort of a, 
an insight. But I think in reality, it is a bit of a step back for the central planners. They are now taking it slower. But ultimately, I think their strategy is, okay, that's how we get it. That's how we get what we want. Because if we um, went straight for retail CBDC, there will be resistance. And I've certainly done my best to put up resistance. I've written articles. I've given lots of interviews warning about the dangers of this retail CBDC and killing the banking system and having a Soviet-style monobank system. Um, I remember there was an event in Switzerland where there was Martin Wolf, also from the Financial Times, and he was going to argue in favor of abolishing banks and just having the central bank do it. And then I, when I said, well, this is the Soviet system. We've had this before. So this is Sovietization. He was shocked. He hadn't thought about that. He didn't realize, oh, I mean, the proposal I've just made is actually to introduce a Soviet central bank. And he didn't like it, I think. He couldn't really, he sort of, you know, reverse his position on the spot. But I think this is really what's happened, that they realize, okay, there will be resistance. And of course, the bankers and even the big banks uh, by now will have begun to wake up. I've contacted several big banks and, and argued, look, you guys, you need to understand what's happening. They're going to kill you as well. And my idea was to get some big banks to support the community banks that I'm setting up because the trouble with the big banks is they don't have a good reputation and the public will say, oh, are we going to kill the big banks? Okay, let's do yeah. it. You know? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Of course. So they have, they have no standing. They won't get the backing. So they can hide behind the small community banks. The big guys should back the establishment of small community banks, which are not competition to them. They're not a threat to them because they do business that the big banks aren't even interested in. But by doing that, it's the small banks, the community banks, the public will stand up for and say, no, we don't want them killed. Let's, let's uh, maintain them. They're very important. And it seems that this is happening to some extent. The, the central planners have realized, okay, there will be too much resistance. Isn't it easier? Why don't we do this and go first the wholesale way? And of course, at the back of their mind, I'm sure, is the idea then once we have that, we can, there will be, we, you know, we'll engineer a crisis. There'll be an excuse. And they'll say, oh, well, now we need to switch to retail. That's, of course, the big risk. Yeah, of course, because then they have the infrastructure available and they can easily just, uh, with a switch, they can uh, completely uh, take over the system. But it's interesting to, and also fascinating uh, for me to hear that um, everyone is just warning about, so, no, we shouldn't go um, the, the direction China is taking and China's already... Uh, went ahead with CBDC and that's that's a nightmare coming to Europe. But in a way, the Chinese are already thinking two steps ahead and and keep the decentralization in the back of their minds and and only want to um, uh, progress gradually while maintaining um, their 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 order and 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 their growth strategy. While in Europe, they um, uh, yes. go the wrong way eventually and possibly. And also, of course, in China, the fact is that they already have been two competing private sector forms of digital currency that if you want to call it digital currency, you know, payments, uh, settlement systems, um, Alipay and WePay, uh, that have become widespread, in fact, dominant. So it's really a different situation. And, and one way it's then quite natural, you can see the center saying, okay, we'll, we'll join there and we're going to compete now against Alipay and WePay. And so far, the central bank is fringe and probably will stay fringe for a while. Um, although that can be changed you know, quite easily. If you're the regulator, you've got many tools at disposal to gain an advantage. But in principle, at the moment at least, the Chinese are saying, okay, well, the central bank um, is just one of the players and there's other players offering the same product. Now that's what we don't hear in Europe. So, um, but it's the first step that there, there seems to be this indication, the message is being given out, okay, maybe we'll move to the wholesale CBDC first. Next, we, what we should hear is that, okay, and well, let's have alternatives to that, because that wholesale CBDC should also be competing with private sector offerings. So let's have the equivalence of Alipay and WePay, and why not various cryptocurrencies and alternative currencies as well? And uh, let's get them also um, established as part of the system, you know, so that there are actually options and alternatives, because that's what we have in China. 
Yeah, but at the same time, whether you are in China or Europe, uh, liberty is at stake eh? because in, in China yeah. we, have, we have a social credit system, which I'm sure you're not fond of. In, in Europe, uh, this is also being rolled out with several pilots in Bologna, in Vienna, and uh, CO2 is being measured. Um, the, so it's, it's slowly but surely being introduced here as well. So whether yes. we have full retail CBDC or just wholesale CBDC, uh, our overlords are uh, in any case going that to is monitor true. us. Uh, that is true. That is true. Exactly. So as you say, CBDCs, digital currencies run by a government or government agency or a central bank are dangerous because governments can always say, oh, there's some national uh, interest or even national security reasons why we need to do X, Y, Z, why we can override any privacy concerns you may have, why we need to look into all your transactions and why we need to stop some of you people out there from buying something. Oh, you've used too much CO2. Well, then for today, for the next two days, you've got to stop breathing because you'll be breathing out too much CO2. I mean, ultimately, a regime could argue that, right? Right. But it's scary. Yeah, if you think about it. But that's, so that's, that's unavoidable then, right? That, that trend, um, or everything is avoidable if we stand up and, um, and come together. Um, well, what I also wanted to know is, um, so ECB does seem to take take its time because last year they said oh in five years or so we're going to uh, uh, um, implement it if I mean, we're going to review thoroughly the law and and see if there's uh, um, enough um, probably buy-in from the member states but it will take many more years uh, it seems before the ecb is, is is going to introduce it why are they taking so much time then and do they have that time because maybe the euro will be disintegrated before that time yes yes um, of course, this can be accelerated if circumstances allow a faster track. And that may be the scenario that they're talking now about, okay, this, you know, in the distant future, five years, 10 years, but um, events may then allow a drastic acceleration. Um, and of course, these events um, would be um, what, what follows from, you know, the massive money creation that we've had. Um, since 2008 and then again accelerated since 2020 the increased inflation and if they maintain their misguided policies the inflation will get worse there will be uh, essentially debauching of of uh, existing currencies and the, the call for something new for a reset and then that's where you can accelerate these um, these schemes but it does so the good news is that it does give us a bit of time. And I think we need to use this time to establish many more small local banks, community banks. The more we have, the better. They're trying to shut them down and kill them. But it's now a good opportunity because the, the, the yield curve is getting steeper again. That means banking is, is getting profitable again. Um, and also, we now have to talk about wholesale CBDC, which means that you know, this is a system that allows for, in fact, needs the banks um, for a while. So this is a window of opportunity we, we must use, I think, to establish as many banks as we can that are particularly that are local, um, that are operated or controlled in a, in a democratic, accountable way, because banks are money creators. And the decision of how much money to create and who to give it to for what purpose has such a big impact on society that we need these right types of banks and essentially the the more decentralized and smaller and more local the more accountable they will be and then you can ensure and stakeholders can ensure that the right types of decisions are made yeah. that's how you can make the monetary system accountable and useful for ordinary people and return the power to create money to the people I think the best way and the only way really is to establish many small local banks. They've in, in the Netherlands as well, they've uh, concentrated some, merged it into one. And so the number of banks have gone down. Uh, let's set up new ones because they're now getting profitable again. And it is profitable. Banking remains one of the most profitable industries by its very nature. Um, so that's what we should do. But you have a lot of uh, very reasonable 
suggestions and advice when it comes to banking, like indeed um, more banks maybe have a cap on the size of the bank and banks should only lend for productive investment. And if you want to buy an existing asset, you should get your money from a non-bank and maybe exactly. we should reduce uh, all these uh, stupid AML requirements. We should introduce not retail CBDC. So there's a lot of good things coming from your end. Also Dirk Bezemer in Holland or Steve Keen, quite a few of these, um, uh, of you guys have a lot of great ideas, but I wonder is, is, is the, is the Euro in, in and of itself um not have become is it not too weak by now to still salvage it or is it better to focus on something else altogether or, or do you still yes. think it can be yes. saved uh, yes and no if we want something else then again it will be helpful to have these community banks because they can actually switch you can introduce local currencies quite easily with community banks right okay. they can be the core of um, of a local community uh, currency and transaction system very easily. Um, I mean, in, in Switzerland, the VIA, W-I-R, system was set up in the 1930s um, and it's essentially a private cr mutual credit uh, settlement system where small firms give each other credit and then they pay each other in their own system credit. And it be became very successful, it became very big. They've got a banking license by now. Why? Because it does help, you know, if you've got a bank at the core of this. And so likewise, by setting up community banks, we can use them to introduce alternative currencies. In um, the 1930s, when there was the Great Depression in Germany and Austria, 25% unemployment. There's the famous story of, of the little town in Tyrol called Wörgl. And in this, um, the city of Wörgl, um, the mayor was somebody who's, who's read a lot of books on economics and thought about money. He read also Gesell um, and Silvio Gesell's book. Anyway, he, but he, he was also somebody who had a lot of common sense and he saw the reality that as mayor, he had jobs to do. There was a bridge that needed to be repaired, needed some public building there, some roads need to be, needed to be built. And at the same time, there are lots of people unemployed. Well, there's a match here. You know, we need this work done. These people are looking for work. I'm going to hire them, he said. Well, I don't have the funds. But why do I need funds? They're doing something for the community. So, and we value that. We, we are the community. We just value that. And we give them a certificate which says, you've done something. You've worked eight hours today for the community. The mayor signed this. Is like a receipt for services rendered to the community that he issued. And, you know, it's just the fact they worked on this bridge for eight hours. It's fair enough if at the end of the day they get a certification saying, you did this for us, for the community. Thank you. And then he told his wife, who happened to run um, a large local grocery store with food supplies, please, you must accept these receipts. They've, they've worked now, you know, by the sweat of their, their brows. They've worked for us to do this and of course you know you must accept this and she said well okay i'm fine with this but i have to pay my suppliers you know the farmers and so on. Well, you have to tell them you know they have to accept it and that's how it worked it was literally top down and it it was almost initially on on hope that people will see this but it was very simple and transparent and everyone saw this and of course they worked so that's fair you know they're not like some um, some banker or hedge fund manager or city of London guy who's not really working very hard but getting huge bonuses, right? No, these, these people are working hard. Everyone could see the result, tangible. Here's the receipt. Of course, we'll accept this receipt. That's worth more than any whatever euro issued by the ECB to me, they said. And so it became the currency. And so you can see how um, very quickly then Virgil became prosperous because um, people started to get jobs, unemployment went down, tax revenues actually went up, tax revenues for local taxes were then also in the local currency, uh, in, this, in these receipts for services rendered to the local community, whatever you call them. And uh, it was boomtown. Then the neighboring villages and towns started to do this. And that's when international attention um uh, appeared and and you know even from from uh irving fisher in the us he sent his 
his assistants over and there started to be international articles. And of course, that's when the, the central bank stepped in. And uh, probably choked them. Well, the central bank um, argued, this is totally unacceptable. We've worked very hard for over a decade to create this acid bubble and then to create the crisis and the big Great Depression. And this lowly mayor is just ending the Great Depression? That is criminal. So he must be put into prison. <laughs> that was their argument. Now, unfortunately, the public prosecutor listened to the central bank more than to the mayor. And um, sadly, the mayor was forced to stop this. So he stopped the program. And as was predictable, Virgil fell back into the Great Depression. The people were unemployed again. The town was in destitution. And this experiment, while it worked, it was amazing. And they still can go to the city. And you see the signs. They put them on the bills. This was built with the Virgil uh, money. Um, but the town fell back into the Great Depression. And the central bank was happy. But it's very similar to what's going on right now, because as a as a member uh, of the Eurozone, you are not allowed to issue your own money. So whenever Farofake is or in, or in Italy, they they propose something like uh, like in Burgel, they uh, they cannot because the cause the, the European um, well, actually, uh, legislation can. doesn't allow for it. It does allow for it. It does allow for it because it doesn't have to be called a currency. And technically in Burgel, it wasn't a currency because it was receipts for labor done. Now, what, you can, what is bank money? 95, 97% of our money supply is bank money. What is that? When you look at the legal status of bank money, which is our money supply, it is not legally privileged. It is not. It's simply private company credit. There is no legal privilege. And that's why in, in Switzerland, the VIA system could operate and there's no legal obstacle to that because it's private company credit. And therefore, yeah, you they can set up alternative systems. Until they Sorry. got too big, of course, and then because I, I, you have to admit also, Richard, if, if something like that becomes too big in Europe again, then they will either change the law or change the definition. Exactly. Of course, yeah. that's, that is the risk, but it doesn't mean we should not even try. You know, we should try. And in fact, you know, if you get resistance, then you know you're doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I like, I like your, your strategy of first, like planting all these seeds, having all these community banks, and then shoot the eu uh, shoot shoot the euro uh, break up then at least you have a safety net lifeboats um, exactly exactly yeah. in fact coming back to your question on the euro of course i was one of the um early voices strongly opposing the introduction of the euro um that's documented in in my writings in the 1990s also some letters to the editor in the financial times which managed to get through the census and because of course it never made sense it never made sense for any country um, also not for Germany. It, it made sense for, for none. There was no good economic argument. It was always political. It was always about control. But politically, it also didn't make sense. So that was the trouble with the euro. It, it, it was always a control tool by centralizers and only made sense for them for centralization and power concentration purposes, but for no other reason. And that's why it would be good to get out of it. Greece should have left. It's sad that um, Greece didn't make a stronger effort to, to leave because you could have avoided this massive squeeze and, and suppression uh, that's, that's been going on in, in Greece. Um, but of course, on the other hand, there's also a lot we can do while we are in the Eurozone. Uh, even countries like, Swiss, uh, like, like Spain and Greece. In Greece, we still have credit um, destruction, negative credit growth, the economy is still shrinking, we have very high unemployment. Um, we can still introduce the policy of enhanced debt man and bonds to stop the issuance of government bonds. And instead, do what? Well, in those days, remember, the bond yields were very high, so it was very, very costly to raise money through government bonds. And they were acting as if there's no alternative. That's wrong. Now, just we heard from the ECB today, they want to, you know, keep up with bond purchases. Why? They want to keep yields down to help Italy. Well, Italy has choices. It doesn't have to issue government bonds to fund its public sector borrowing requirement. The alternative has always been bank credit. Get it directly from the creators of the money supply. <laughs> yeah. And you see, even at the peak of this European 
uh, sovereign debt crisis 2011 or around that time when the bond yields for Spain, Ireland, you know, were just pushing. I mean, Ireland was double digit, you know, 20 percent or something. Portugal, 30 percent. Greece, 60 percent bond yields. I mean, crazy stuff. Even at that time, when the, we had such high bond interest rates, you know, if you, gov if you issue new government bonds, that's the interest rate you have to pay. Well, the bank credit interest rate was never higher than 4%. So why didn't, why didn't Greece borrow from its own banks? That's what it should have done. And it would have helped everyone. It would have helped the banks because they get business. You need to, to help banks, they need to expand. And of course, they were happy to lend to the lowest risk borrower, which is the government. But by doing that, we've get, we get bank credit creation for real economy transactions, which boosts your nominal GDP, which means you get more tax revenues, the whole economy expands, you have job creation, and you get out of the recession. But that was, that was discouraged, but there was no legal obstacle. So it was just politically, political pressure, arm twisting to not do this. But I've made this proposal also to Spain. I've presented it, in fact, in Brussels, at a gathering, which was quite fortuitous in 2011, of all the finance ministry officials, uh, you know, every finance ministry sent officials to this gathering in Brussels of the entire EU, and I presented it. So it's out there, they can still do it. And that way you have money creation in your domestic banking system, particularly in countries where we still have very weak economy. Um, and that includes Portugal, Spain, Ireland and, and obviously Greece right. and some others. And, and in, indeed, I also read today that the ECB is uh, planning on probably uh, expanding again their, um, their bond uh, purchase. Exactly, bond which, which, they also, they also which creates them. these wrong incentives, you know, because right. that is just fueling an asset bubble and you're pushing down bond, bond yields, um, you know, artificially when, when we have inflation, which, which is crazy. So that's, that's an alternative, but of course it takes away from the ECB's power, so to speak, because it's a decentralized measure that finance ministries take, and that's why the ECB doesn't really want to contemplate it. Right, but is it possible then that the ECB uh, keeps on buying bonds while uh, increasing the interest rates? Because they say we first want to stop the bond programs and then we're going to raise interest rates. But now they're saying, oh, we're probably going to go uh, ahead with, uh, with the continuation of these programs. But they, at the same time, they probably need to start raising rates in order to tame inflation. Um, will, what, is the, what is the outlook for the ECB yes. in the next well, uh, 12 months? The, there's two scenarios. One is the, um, the smarter scenario, if the ECB wants to adopt some smarter policies. And one is the disaster policy scenario the disaster policy scenario is where the ecb says um that well you know as you mentioned we need to um make sure the bond yields don't go up so much we're buying lots of government bonds to to push down the yields you know um raise the bond prices which means the yields are pushed down italian government bonds and that we do that a lot but when they do this, they create money this is money creation that fuels the inflation um, and therefore, there's going to be more pressure on bond yields to go up. Then they buy more government bonds. And therefore, you get the scenario where you essentially have accelerating, ever accelerating inflation. It will be an exponential curve that ultimately, you know, will go to galloping Weimar style hyperinflation. While at the same time, they will, they're suppressing, they're, they're, they're raising, so they're suppressing the long rates. But they're raising the short rates because they're saying, oh, we have inflation now. We should raise short rates. So then you have an inverted yield curve, which is bad for banks. And that would be another way of causing a disaster combination. So I mean, it would be very stupid to do this. But sadly, <laughs> there is a good chance that that's exactly the policy combination, which doesn't make any sense. But they will adopt. Now, if they were smarter, they would, they would just do something completely different. Um, which is to stop money creation for asset purchases. Just stop that. Let the market set the bond yields um, and encourage banks to increase bank credit for the real economy, therefore have a positive yield curve. And actually, you would raise short-term rates because you'd say, no, we, we're getting more growth. We want to have more growth. 
Um, more growth means higher rates. That's why we're raising rates on the short end and let them let them go up on the long end to have a proper steep, steepening yield curve. Um, and at the same time, ensure that credit created both by the central bank and the banking system is mainly for productive purposes, business investment, not for asset purchases. And that could be done with some very simple um, rules and regulations and everything else you can forget about. Just drop all other policies. You'd get um, sooner or later the end of inflation and you get you know, growing real growth. So inflation would fall away. Real growth would accelerate um, and you'd grow your way out of the previous accumulated debt. Yeah, and one of the lead economists of the Rabobank also said to me the other day, Let, let's also just write down all the ECB, uh, as all the, the bonds that ECB currently um, has. Uh, so then the debt to GDP ratios go down a lot for all the European countries, sort of a, a reset or, or a clean slate, because it doesn't really matter that money has been spent anyway. So yeah, it's not inflationary. That's true. That's true. That's true. Do you agree? Uh, that is true. Uh, but actually, you probably wouldn't even have to do that. You could do it. In fact, that's always been one of my proposals when you have a, um, or even the banking system, non-performing asset problem, get the central bank to purchase them at face value and forget about it because the damage has been done. That's history. You now need to be forward looking. So in that sense, I agree. But actually, you will find that you don't even have to do it if you adopt the policies I've recommended because you get so much economic growth, the thanks to the growth and, and you won't incur new deficits so that your deficit GP ratios will improve as deficits go down, as you get a recovery and GDP goes up and the debt to GDP ratios also go down as the debt goes down and GDP goes up. So ultimately that way after a few years, you will grow your way out of it. But of course on top, you could do it as well. It's just slightly more uh, dramatic when you yeah, announce optics that. Optics are good, I guess, because a lot of like, journalists, they keep on harping about the ECB balance sheet. Every, uh, I mean, in Twitter, they always talk about the ECB balance sheet. Even uh, Lagarde got the question the other day from the Dutch journalist about the balance sheet. So maybe just to avoid a lot of stupid questions about the balance sheet, we uh, <laughs> possibly should just clean it up. Um, well, th thanks so much, Richard. I also want to spend some time. I know you, uh, we, we dis discussed and, and, and uh, agreed that we should keep it to 45 minutes, but it's, it's taking a bit longer. I'm sorry for that. But I also <laughs> would really want to know about uh, the Fahala ne Network because two years ago, uh, that wasn't there yet. You, you did all, already plea for, uh, a, 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 for more community banks, but now you're actually working on something uh, really awesome that could uh, help um, the development of more community banks uh, across Europe. Uh, the Valhalla Network, could you um, explain to us what it's all about? Yes. Well, the Valhalla Network um, is um, going to issue digital tokens um, that are essentially um, voting rights in a, a decentralized autonomous organization. And this DAO um, is involved in improving the, the monetary system. Um, and that includes setting up community banks, which of course are profitable and will pay some, uh, some yields and dividends to the owners. There's a foundation uh, involved and uh, essentially it's, it's a network so that there is an alternative currency, but it's grounded in the idea of setting up community banks and it's directly connected to these community banks. So there's some real value there um, because we thought, and I'm, I'm working there with um, um, one of my um, associates, I've been working already longer on other projects, um, Oli Studd, we thought it's crazy. We've got all these digital currencies out there, these alternative currencies, and, and often there's nothing behind it. There's nothing to back it. Um, there are some, some, you know, use, uses being talked about and some have some, uh, you know, distributed ledger technologies that can be used for certain things and smart things. But um, ultimately, uh, a lot of them, there's, there's not very much behind it. So we thought, well, since we're talking about and we have been involved in setting up community banks, and I've, you know, we're making some progress um, in England and some, some other countries too now. Um, why don't we have an alternative token um, digital currency that is directly backing this and is directly at the core of this? Because then that's really what we need. And we can then also be in the space where we set up these community banks, we would have 
uh, you know, ready local currency or a network currency, combinations of that. It just opens up so many options. And just at this time and, and, and moment where the existing currencies are increasingly being debauched by the central banks and people are looking for alternatives, maybe we should actively be out there offering such an alternative. But I can imagine that um, the central bank or the regulators do not allow a decentralized autonomous organization to own or to partially own banks, right? Because you have the FETF requirements, the AML requirements. Do you think they're going to let a DAO participate in, yes. in banking? Well, there are structures. There are structures where, of course, it's you know it's at arm's length, and you have a essentially a charitable foundation that um, is an owner, and uh, you know there's this. So, because the, so the tokens are essentially voting rights, but they're not shareholdings as such. You know, there's, there's ways you can right. get around these things. Um, but it's clear, you know, it is a community, it's a network. And if you participate in network, then that's what you're backing. And that's what we can, we can get and we can get uh, the usage um, advantages out from. Fascinating. And when will it uh, be launched? Um, well, we are, we are actually moving to the, um, we had an original seed round. We're moving to the um, Series A round of raising some money shortly. And so hopefully, um, we've already raised a significant amount of money. Um, but hopefully in a couple of months, we can uh, move to the next phase. Great. Well, I'll put a link to uh, the website in the show notes. Uh, but uh, yeah, good luck with that. Uh, sounds very interesting. I will definitely uh, read the white paper. Um, yes, please. And, the white paper's uh, there. Yeah. Any other things, uh, Richard, from your end that you want to add to the conversation? Um, well, there's. I think I think we we discussed on what's what's currently um, important and new and on this on this front of of currency systems and digital currency. This this recognition that okay, we're they're not going to move directly to retail CBDC, which which I think is great news, and so. Um, I think um, for my team and my people, this is a real boost because it means, yes, we have, as I, as I was suspecting would, but uh, it's now getting more apparent. We have exactly that window that we need to now establish these banks and get going. Um, but perhaps, yeah, I mean, you know, if people want to support us. That would be very helpful. There's, there's several ways you can do that. One is the Valhalla network. Another one is to be directly involved with some of the community banks and become shareholder in these community banks. Um, we're, we're looking at various areas in England. So get in touch if you want to support that. Um, and otherwise, um, you know, try to try to find out more. I mean, for, for the viewers, um, about what's what's really going on in terms of the money creation process and what the, the central planners are doing. We need to spread the word. More and more people are becoming aware of what's happening. Gold is perhaps another topic one could briefly mention. I still like it. It's, it's an area where, because the gold price, in my view, has been totally suppressed, it's still cheap. I mean, think about it. We've had this massive inflation. Um, and yet gold is unchanged or still, you know, is sort of going down even. Um, well, the good news is, hey, this is one place where you can put your money that is, in my view, safe if you have physical control and access to it. And that is still cheap after two years of inflation. Right. Quite extraordinary, really. Um, but otherwise, yes, help us setting up community banks. Yeah, maybe on, on top of a go topic of gold, do you think it is going to be part of some uh, global reset? Because uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, maybe a, a new s synthetic yeah. um, hegemonic currency, like Mike Mark Carney said, and, and the BIS and IMF are also talking about uh, how maybe to use the SDR. And are, are we going to some sort of um, world coin? And is gold maybe going to back that a little bit, just like uh, we had in, uh, in Bretton Woods uh, era? It's possible, but it's speculation. Um, ultimately, any gold standard that included banking systems wasn't really a strict gold standard. In theory, you know, any new money credit should be backed by gold, but that was never the case. But it was still 
it was you know a, a disciplining feature because you could get people demanding the gold as we saw in you know 69 70 71 when the french went to the us and said you know please give us the gold uh, because we have the right according to the imf treaties um us dollar can be changed to gold we're doing that and that called the bluff and so then we've had the temporary suspension of gold convertibility of the us dollar ever since of course um so if they introduce a link to gold it will be in a way a sort of pr device to get credibility it won't in reality back every you know all the money creation uh, it will be a similar device the question is would they really want to put that discipline upon them i doubt it uh, but that's Essentially, that speculation, it doesn't really matter because gold, I think, will maintain its value either way um, and is, is a tool that's under your control and therefore is an alternative asset, particularly when you need something mobile. Right, right. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Richard. Uh, sure, I hope to, to do it again um, in the future. Um, good luck with all the traveling. Um, I'll put all the show notes uh, underneath the video and uh, yeah take care and keep on um, educating us thanks very much all the best take care bye bye Bye, richard